right now on No More Down Low. Are we under the microscope? Has the media's coverage of same-sex relationships caused a backlash? I'm Janora McDuffie. Has our quest for equality led to more public scrutiny? It's still fairly new. Then, hear the incredible story of how one person transitioned to become who he is today. And I'm Kendall Hogan. Hear the remarkable story of why Kiana transitioned to become Kai. Then, from Lisa Ray McCoy to Raven Simone, celebrity hairstylist Dr. Boogie has touched the heads of some of our favorite stars. But what is his real passion? It's all coming up next on No More Down Low. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Monifa from TV One's R&B Divas, and you're watching No More Down Low. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It's the largest repository of LGBT material in the world. What's up, everyone? I'm Kendall Hogan. And I'm Janora McDuffie, and today we are on location at the One National Gay and Lesbian Archives in the historic Adams District of Los Angeles. It's part of the University of Southern California Libraries. Now, this place has over two million items that document the history of LGBT people. Now, later on, we're gonna get to some of those priceless gems, but up first, we've got a story from Mark Noble all about LGBT coverage in the media. We have just learned some brand new developments in the legal trouble for former Lady Vol standout Shamiqua Holtzclaw. After police say she attacked her ex-girlfriend, former WNBA teammate, Holtzclaw is now headed to court. He's being charged of abusing his ex-boyfriend. Images, not perhaps the best of LGBT people of color, but nonetheless a part of living under the eye of the spotlight. Former WNBA player Shamika Holtzclaw's face was completely covered as Fulton County Sheriff's deputies guided her to a waiting car. It, like a part of traditional means of relationships, are amongst the stories which have captured the eye of the national media. The boyfriend was putting some soy sauce on Kwame's rice. I guess he put too much soy sauce on oh. the rice. They got to arguing and bickering, and next thing you know, it escalated to a fight. You, you, you overseas in my food, you deserve to be punched. Yeah, but I think it's fair for the media to cover our relationships, whether good or bad. Victor Kearney covers the media and LGBT issues on his blog site, Southern for Life, blogspot.com. It's good for people to see that, one, we just like everybody else, we have our problems, we have our you know, trials and tribulations that we go through. So it's important to pay attention to those things. But I think they should be fair. If they're going to show um, issues of people falling out or fights or divorce, they have to also show the celebration of love that we have, our marriages, how we found each other, um, how long we've been with each other. You know, celebrate those as well. Add to that the most recent example on the anti-gay attack and shooting in New York City. Police are using surveillance pictures to track down a group of men believed to have attacked a gay couple in Midtown the other night. The family would also like to have justice be served so that Mark's death is not in vain. Yeah. All of this on the heels as Pride celebrations get underway. And as the nation awaits the outcome of the Supreme Court, which weighs in on the cases of California Prop 8 Marriage Equality and DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. On the surface, for many soldiers in the field, it pertains to LGBT issues, as the media and its place in the reporting of a factual story. You always knew you were gay? Yeah, it's, uh, I sort of describe it as you, you know that the sky is blue, but you keep telling yourself that it's red. Jason Collins is one of the examples as told to ABC's Good Morning America. This spring he revealed he is one of the few out NBA players, and for many he is a trailblazer, but to others not so much. Attention which seemingly makes LGBT issues watercolor conversation as the LGBT is in a position to be more responsible for itself. It's incredible. Um, just try to live an honest, genuine life, and next thing you know, you have the president calling you. <laughs> On the heels of the Jason Collins announcement, ESPN coincidentally inserted themselves in the Collins story by deliberately pitting openly gay writer L.Z. Granderson with a religious-leaning Chris Brossard. If you're openly living that type of lifestyle, then the Bible says you know them by their fruits. It says that, you know, that's a sin. And just because someone doesn't agree with one person's interpretation of the Bible versus the other doesn't mean that they have the exclusive right 
to dictate what that person, how that person should live. And now that we're on the football field and the basketball court, the people are freaked out because they don't own masculinity anymore. They don't know what to do now that their brothers who will slip out of their Jordans and into a pair of pumps. It's still fairly new. And then you're talking about athletes, which is a whole nother situation. So at this point, I see why it was blown up. But I think once we are out more, once they see more of us as a couple, as in relationships, this will be just as normal. Leaving that journey for LGBT people of color to pave and lead the way for those to come. Reporting in Hollywood, Mark Noble for No More Download. Thank you so much, Mark, for that excellent report. Well, we are here at the One National Gay and Lesbian Archives, and I am with Chris Freeman, one of the board members. How you doing, Chris? I'm great. So glad to have you here. All right, and I feel it. We are surrounded by gay history. Tell me a little bit more about this that. This is where the whole gay history of America lives, inside this building. And it's a story that goes back over 60 years, and that's part of what's so fascinating about it. Back in the 1940s, a few guys hanging out in West Hollywood and Silver Lake formed a group called the Mattachine Society secretly meeting in living rooms, didn't know each other's last names, closed the blinds, the whole thing, because the LAPD was very aggressive and not very nice to homosexuals in those days. Mm -hmm. But uh, those guys decided to start an organization. Very quickly in the early 1950s, they decided they needed a magazine. And one of the members, an African-American guy named Bailey uh, Whitaker, gave a famous quote from a poet, which is, a mystic bond of brotherhood makes all men one. So that's where the name One comes from. Share with me some of the highlights here. Well, there's you know there's just such a treasure trove of things. A couple of my favorite items. We have a, um, a sign, a placard from one of the original marches around the White House. And if you notice, it says um, uh, homosexual citizens want to roll in great society too. So that means LBJ. That means we're in 19, late 1960s here. Wow. Essex Hemphill, the poet who died of AIDS in the early 90s, he was part of a movie with uh, Marlon Riggs called Tongues Untied, 1989. Very controversial on PBS. We have a wonderful Pulp Fiction thing here. Uh, we have a great collection of sort of 1950s and 60s soft cover pulp fiction. That's about um, uh, a black guy named Ollie who is out to avenge Whitey. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff we have here. Um, some Audre Lorde, obviously one of the most important voices in not only the black, the black movement, the, the gay and lesbian movement, and the feminist movement. Uh, and also two new books about the archive, letters written to the, to the magazine from the 50s and 60s. Um, as well as a history of sort of gay LA and, and this place. Wow. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And if someone wants to donate their own treasures to the archive. Well, that's how we survive, you know, um, and how we grow. We want people's papers. We want their diaries, we want their photographs, we want whatever kind of interesting memorabilia. So they should go to our website or call okay. us, uh, onearchives.org, or they can call us and set up an appointment. We have several full time staff archivists who help you know, collect the materials and go through them and catalog them, and make them available for researchers, for students. We're part of USC Libraries, uh, so we have a great kind of infrastructure for researchers. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. Well, we'll post all that information on the No More Download website. What are you up to, Kendall? Janora, you can find a variety of publications here that chronicle the black LGBT experience like this 1957 CPA Magazine article about the ballroom culture in New York and Chicago. The article includes black and white photos of the lovely ladies decked out as their favorite stars of the time, like Lena Horne, Pearl Bailey, and even Billie Holiday. The article goes on to mention that the evening usually ended with an announcement to the revelers to go straight home before the midnight curfew, because those who didn't likely ended up behind bars for the rest of the night. Stay with us more from the One National Gay and Lesbian Archives when we return. Coming up, Becoming Kai. Hear the incredible story of how one person transitioned to become who he is today. Then, it's a dog's tale. We'll meet a celebrity hairstylist who has another passion that's gone to the dogs. It's all coming up next on No More Download. Welcome back to No More Down Low, coming to you from the One National Gay and Lesbian Archives on the campus of USC here in Los Angeles. Now, if you love to read, and I love books, you will really like this place. This place has some amazing books, many by and about famous black luminaries such as J. 
James Baldwin, Audre Lorde, and Bayard Rustin, just to name a few. Janora, what are you up to? Ah, I love them all, Kendall. Now, visiting the archives is like taking a step back into time. Take a listen. I've heard about your lover, your thin and brown. I've heard about your sheep and hand me down. The song is titled, How Much Can I Stand? It was recorded by Gladys Bentley, renowned tuxedo dress lesbian singer and band leader during the 20s and 30s, a staple at the Ubanji Club in Harlem. This is just one of the many recordings you could hear at One Archives. Now our next story is about a woman who made a life-changing decision, transitioning to become the person she always wanted to be. Laurencia Dandridge introduces us to Kiana and discovers how and why she became Kai. When people can't figure out if you are male or female, then they have a tendency to not see you as human at all. A startling observation on public perceptions of trans men by Kai Green, who was born Kiana and made a bold and personal decision to stray from conventional gender roles. A lot of transgender folks will have the narrative, I was born in the wrong body and my whole life, you know, I've been trapped in this body and I just need to get out so that I can be free and be who I truly am supposed to be. Now, I personally have a different perspective just because that, that is not my journey. Kai's very unique journey did include a radical female to male transition with the aid of hormone therapy and top surgery to remove the breast while retaining the female genitalia. Transitioning for me um, has been about changing my body, but more than that, it's been about being fully present to everything that I'm feeling physically and mentally and emotionally, all of those things at once. In order to understand who Kai is today, it helps to see him as Kiana before he transitioned. Without you, I am nothing and... We first met Kiana three years ago. A social activist marching with the LGBT contingency in LA's Martin Luther King Jr. Day Parade. We're, we should be in the Pride marches, but this is important for us too, because this is home. And she walked the runway in the Butch Voices fashion show. Throughout his life, Kai has always challenged the concept of traditional gender identification. Before I decided to transition, I was a masculine identified woman, um, very gay, and now I identify as a trans man, still read as very gay. So <laughs> no matter how you put it, I would just be gay. So I guess that's my destiny. Part of Kai's destiny includes facing the everyday challenges of life, like choosing public restrooms. There are moments where people have done double takes and you know, like, what are you? Oh, okay. You know, things like that happen, but in a men's room, I have not had any trouble finding housing. And then when I asked for an application, he was like, oh no, um, I'll, I'll email you. And going through airport security. I asked the guy, I said, are you trying to figure out if I'm a man or a woman? And he was like, yes. And I said, well, I don't care who you get to pat me down, just, you know, it, it doesn't really matter to me. And he got really frustrated. But despite society's confusion with Kai's androgynous look, there is one thing that he wants everyone to know. Living life as a trans man is really about living life as a human being. I want you to know that we are all different and we all have different experiences and we have dreams, we have goals, we have, I wanna say just like everybody else. Kai is a PhD candidate in American Studies and Ethnicity right here at USC. He's completing his dissertation on the history of same gender loving people in Los Angeles. I have no doubt that Kai's findings are gonna end up at One Archives one day. Kendall? Janora, Housed Here at One Archives is a fascinating photographic collection of Miles Everett. Known for his nudes of African American men, often against a black background, he began photographing black men in the 1930s and is said to have been a major influence in the works of famed photographer Robert Maplethorpe. So the man in our next story knows a little bit about the world of photography also. You can find him behind the scenes at a photo shoot, running his fingers through the hairs of some of Hollywood's leading ladies, 
but he has a new project on the side. And this new pet project is nothing to bark at. Why do we call Boogie Dr. Boogie? Well, A, you have to call and make an appointment. From Keisha Cole to Kamor Lee Simmons, from Lisa Ray to Taraji P. Henson, from Megan Good to Gabrielle Union, when it comes to hair, Dr. Boogie is sheer genius. If I put my hands in your head, it's the greatest orgasm you ever had. You'll never want to have sex again. But unlike many of Hollywood's top celebrity stylists, the Richmond, California native reveals it was his heartbreaking childhood past that led him to his talent for styling women's hair. My mom was battered. So going through that situation with my mom, I used to get behind the couch and I used to do her hair and I, it would make her feel good. So after learning that, wow, this is really something that even if I'm massaging her hair and I'm brushing her hair, it was making her feel good. So at the time I learned that that was like a powerful move that I had that could come through my hands. So I was like, this is something that I really, really like. Eventually, Boogie moved to Hollywood and with some aggressive networking, things began to happen. I basically just started finding celebrities and walking up to them and being very bold and just being like, girl, let me hook you up. And then one day, um, a friend of mine, uh, hooked me up with Kamora Lee Simmons, and I went to her house to do a house call. Fell in love with me. He, that was just like the end of all. It takes time. I was persistent, and once they start seeing me in certain circles, it just happened for me. You wear him, yeah. And something else has just happened to Boogie too. He found a passion for breeding Italian Mastiff Cane Corso dogs, a breed that can sell anywhere from one to three thousand dollars. She's all blue. That's my baby. Her name is Naomi. And why is she my baby? Because she's like my child. And I get life and joy out of taking them to the park three times a day, watching them run. And just recently, Naomi got knocked up. I have nine babies under one roof. Can you believe it? And uh, they're my babies. I love them to death. Like, I respect the fact that they, they're people too and they need homes. Because I love dogs. Dr. Boogie is enjoying so much success, he just launched his own line of hair care products. To find out more about the line, go to our No More Down Low website. And that is it for our show today. Take a look at what's coming up on our next show. On the next No More Down Low, black LGBT murders unsolved. When it went to voicemail, I knew something was really, really wrong. 19-year-old Rashawn Brazel was decapitated, his body meticulously cut up, stuffed into garbage bags, and dumped in a New York City subway station. The pain. The heartbreak, the mystery. No More Down Low asks the question, why are black LGBT murders going unsolved? So all that and more on our next show. Now, Janora, I gotta tell you, this place is amazing, oh, yeah. fascinating. I learned so much today. Me too. And if you would like to be a part of history and donate your items, or find out how to access this wealth of information, go to the No More Down Low website. So, from the one national gay and lesbian archives at the University of Southern California, reminding you to spread love and not hate, I'm Janora McDuffie. And I'm Kendall Hogan. We'll see you next time. Place is great, right? Yeah, let's go read some books. More books? Yeah. I'm down, let's do it.